plants like the amaranth and the batwa. And if you have herbicide tolerant crops like soya bean, you can't grow anything else. And as our research has shown, it's only when there is biodiverse intensity that we get all the nutrients we need. And in fact, as our report Health Per Acre, which is available on the Navdanya website, shows that when we intensify biodiversity, which means grow more things together, we actually increase nutrition per acre and production per acre. So our small farms, you know, 80% of our farms are less than two hectares. Small farms can very effectively be biodiverse intensive and ecologically intensive. And our calculations on the basis of real farm shows that if farming was done on the basis of biodiversity rather than monocultures, we would have enough nutrition for two Indias. GMOs are not the answer. Our own biodiversity is. But of course, our biodiversity makes us sovereign. It gives us Beet Swaraj. It gives us Anna Swaraj. And no colonizer has ever wanted a sovereign slave. And that is the issue before us on seed and on food. But it's not just about sovereignty as freedom. It has now become sovereignty as freedom to stay alive. Because what those high cost seeds, and our, my calculations are 71,000% increase. I used to say 8,000%, and then someone challenged it. So I sat with the figures. I said, okay, it used to be 5 rupees a kilo for cotton seed. And it jumped to 3,600, 4,000 rupees a kilo. Just do the calculations of how much more. 17,000%. Now, no farmer can bear that kind of jump in costs. How do they get these seeds? Do they have money to buy it? No. They sign away their life. They sign away their land. They, they don't even know they're signing their land. The sales agent of the chemical and seed companies just gets them to put a thumbprint on a blank piece of paper and then fills in the rest. And right here in Maharashtra, we have the capital of BT cotton and the capital of farmer suicides in Vidharva. Overall, nationally, since 95, when these new regimes were put in place of the ability to monopolize seed, we have lost nearly 3 lakh of our fellow citizens through farmer suicides. And one area where I really feel it would be very useful is for some of you to volunteer with our team. We have a very strong team. We are saving seeds in Vidarbha. We are helping farmers go organic. We are then linking to the Gandhi ashrams for or khadi, organic Khadi production. But I think it's very important that some of you actually go and understand how farmers get indebted. How an unpayable debt trap pushes them to suicide. So that's at the end of the farmers. Where seed freedom goes, farmers end up committing suicide. But we are committing a species suicide. Mr. Ranganathan and I were talking before we came here about what's happening to our food. After all, toxic seed will give you toxic food. But it isn't just the toxics in the seed, it's everything we add after. The first generation of toxics are when you grow monocultures with chemicals, you will have more pests. You will then spray more pesticides. Those pesticides will be in the food. There's enough studies to show that wherever there's higher pesticide use, there's higher occurrence of cancer. In Punjab, they've done studies. The PGI, the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, has done studies. They've looked at areas where pesticide use is less and areas where pesticide use is more and found higher pest, uh, cancer rate. And now there's a train that leaves Punjab called the cancer train. Goes to Bikaner because the Jains set up a charitable hospital. 
the three big pockets of cancer are Bhopal where we have the tragedy in 1984, Punjab itself and the endosulfan areas. Huge cancer zones. But cancer isn't the only issue. So pesticides are causing this. this Everywhere in the country, we are being asked to spray this chemical called Roundup. Also, its active ingredient is glyphosate. Sri Lanka did studies because suddenly they had 400,000 people with kidney failure and 20,000 dead. So it was a national emergency. The government asked government doctors to study this from medical schools. And they looked at everything and then removed factors that were common to other places. At the end of it, the only thing that was ha happening in this pocket with high kidney failures was the use of glyphosate. We were talking about more and more kidney failures. I'm finding in the Himalaya more and more kidney failures because everyone's being told to use this as a herbicide. Worse, it's being used as a desiccant, which means if your grain isn't dry and you know it's purchased according to how much moisture there is, farmers are told to spray Roundup just before the sale of grain. So it reduces the moisture level. And of course the companies that make them will say it's safe. Now there are new studies being done. And I won't go into all the details of these studies, but just indicative. In America, the animals started to have stillbirths and spontaneous abortions on a very large scale to the extent that uh, if you had a dairy, you couldn't maintain your herd. A very, very eminent scientist said, okay, he was invited by the farmers to look. So he looked and he found that the soils had lost all their beneficial organisms and a new pathogenic organism came up which then was carried in the corn and through the corn was carried to animal feed and this was what was leading to the toxicity leading to abortions. Also finding that the deprivation of diets in micronutrients and trace elements plus the toxics in food are totally destroying our gut biodiversity. Just like there's biodiversity in forests, there's biodiversity in oceans, there's even richer biodiversity in our gut. And of course there's biodiversity in the soil. And when beneficial organisms die in the gut, pathogens take over. And every organism in the gut plays a role in maintaining our mental and physical health. One of the other issues that's showing up is there are these upward graphs on all new diseases that are growing in epidemic proportions. Autism, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, all of which are related to brain function. And they're finding out GMOs plus glyphosate has a 99.9% .9 correlation with the growth of this. Now, it, the scientists who are working on it aren't just stopping at the correlation, they're working on the processes. What is it that these things are doing? And glyphosate chelates, binds metals. It's not letting the body get what it needs. So those who are eating this stuff aren't doing very well either. The freedom, the bead swaraj of the farmer is being taken away. But the anna swaraj of every citizen is being taken away. And because there's so much misconception on GMOs, let me just mention, how does a GMO a genetically engineered organism actually get constructed. A GMO does not involve any new breeding. Whatever plants have been bred in whatever way by farmers or public universities or companies, those plants are what is used to shoot a new gene into it. The plants are not constructed through genetic engineering. Shooting the gene is what genetic engineering does from an unrelated organism. And in the case of Bt, it's a soil organism. In the case of other crops that haven't been commercialized, they had 
um, flounder genes, fish genes in tomatoes, scorpion genes in cabbage, uh, many of these things never ever reached commercialization. But anything you can put from anywhere you put, there's a US, UK wheat trial with cow genes in wheat to control one fungal disease which is totally controllable through organic farming. You don't have to put cow genes into wheat. I mean, I'm, and I think it's a good ethical question to ask. What people who don't eat cows, you know, do, are they eating a cow when they eat a gene of a cow in a wheat? These questions we haven't raised. I, but I can tell you, when we were negotiating the UN Treaty on Biodiversity, I gave these descriptions of what was going on, and many countries asked for biosafety assessment because of movement of genes across species barriers. But it's a very unreliable, sh you know, it's like me being blindfolded and just shooting. Now, I don't know where this bullet will go. So when you shoot with a gene gun, you don't know where it's going. And you don't know if it's being absorbed by the cell. Because all this is done at the cellular level. So they add an antibiotic resistance marker. And then they pour antibiotics on the Petri dish. And if the cell lives, it was a tr successful transfer. And if the cell dies, and then the new gene doesn't get expressed properly in the, just like with organ transplants, you have to add all kinds of chemicals. In this case, they add viruses as promoters. So every GMO as a food has a toxic gene, an antibiotic resistance marker, which means if you have TB and you're ad eating an antibiotic resistance marker food, your TV drug won't work. And third is the virus promoter. And the H1N1 was a mixture of viruses linked to three species. The human, the chicken, and the pig. This mixing of viruses and hybridization is being accelerated as species boundaries are being crossed more. So when genetic engineering moves genes consciously, Other genes move beyond our control. And is the technology working on producing more food? No. Is it reducing chemicals? No. There's more use of chemicals. Is it successful in doing the two things of reducing pests and reducing weeds? No. We've got super pests. The bollworm is resistant. In the US, half the farms are overtaken by super weeds. And now they're new applications that have been approved in the United States for crops resistance to 2,4-D, which is an ingredient of Agent Orange, which was sprayed on Vietnam. And of course, the failure of this means they're coming up with promises of new miracles, and most of these are in the area of so-called biofortification. One is golden rice. We are going to put vitamin A into rice. But I've done calculations, our dhania and our curry patta and our amaranth have far more vitamin A than they'll ever get after 50 years through genetic engineering in rice. Now they want to do a GMO banana. They say Indian women are dying of anemia. And it's true, we have iron deficiency anemia among women. So we're going to give them GMO banana. GMO banana has, you know, banana has 0.44 milligrams iron. They'll increase it five times. About two. How much do the haldi have? How much does our imli have? 68, 40 milligrams, thousands of percent more. Which is why literacy about our biodiversity and literacy about our food cultures and nutrition becomes very, very important. Now, you will think, oh, it's fine. I'm going to have my little chips and my Coke. It creates a totally non-sustainable body. The poor body is not designed for artificial foods, as Mr. Ranganathan said. The cells, we might be stupid to not know the difference between healthy food and bad food. But the cells in our body have more intelligence. They can make out the difference. And all diseases are related to some toxic or the other being introduced into our body that the body cannot tolerate. The response is cancers, inflammatory diseases, 
one of the inflammatory diseases is um, asthma. The brain functions. They're finding out half the teenagers of Australia are depressed. So the doctors, the public health specialists, did biochemistry scans of the brain. All had zinc deficiency. 